Hi, I'm Fabrice Harari. Welcome to WinDevCon 2007 Protect Your Software course. Being by soft, by hard, and by lawyer, you're going to protect your software somewhere or another. So we're going to talk about the simplest system uh, up to the full license management schema and all the things that turn around that. How can you protect your software? There are several means. You can protect it by soft, either by coding it yourself or by using an external tool uh, done f exactly for that and you'll have to pay for it. Then you can also um, protect it by using hardware and of course the solution in that case is to use a dongle say hello to PCSoft who is using that solution with the product we are using every day. Uh, then, of course, you can also protect your uh, software using a lawyer. That goes through first having a license that is uh, displayed when you install your software uh, to tell the user what rights he has and what uh, rights he has not. Then uh, a contract when you are writing a specific software for somebody. What kind of right does he have, does he have not, um, and of course there's also the possibility to make a lawsuit to somebody who doesn't follow the rules and all that are protection either before or after the fact but they are protection uh, for your software. So we're going to talk about all that in much more details of course uh, in the following course. Why do you want to protect your software? It looks like an obvious uh, question, but you really have to think about it uh, for a minute. Of course, you don't want anybody using your software without paying you. Are you sure? Because from what I've read, uh, some very big companies had a lot of success with uh, software that were not protected. So everybody would use a free version of the software and by free I mean of course a uh, copy uh, of the software and learn how to use it. And then they would go in a company and they would say oh this tool is great and the company would buy the tool which wouldn't have been the case if the guy in the first place didn't use a copy of the software. So um, you have to think uh, quite a lot about about it and ask yourself is it uh, something that you want to do? How? To what extent? There are a lot of different possibilities and they are not all equal. Now in what case do you want uh, to protect your software? Uh, by what case I mean what kind of software it is, how does it work, what does it imply, because depending on that you're going to have to choose a solution, a protection solution that is adapted to the thing. Clearly if it's a small software in a shareware schema, uh, a dongle protection is not going to be practical. Now, if it's a big, complex software for multi-user professional environment, then is the dongle a good solution? Is an external tool a good solution inside soft uh, or just a contract enough? Uh, and there's no one answer to these questions. It's really, again, a case-by-case -case basis. So we're going to talk about all these different cases in, in order for you to be able to find what you need, what you want, uh, and what you are going to do. In every case, you have to remember that it's a losing proposition. Every protection is breakable. Uh, in case you're not aware of that, uh, there are hacked version of PCSoft project out there. Uh, they are generally older version, but uh, if you can uh, break uh, one dongle protection, you can break another one. And not only every protection 
is breakable but it will be broken just the simple fact that you are putting a protection on something means that it's going to be broken at some point and just to give you an idea I have currently two small software uh, in the shareware uh, area uh, they are sold for 10 bucks a piece and 15 bucks a piece extremely expensive piece of software and they are protected by a software uh, an external tool in that case um, in order for me not to have to deal with that part because for something that is that uh, small I didn't see the point of uh, coding a whole thing and managing it myself so I wanted to have a, a mind free solution uh, I used an external tool and it's working well except that uh, if you look on the web for a hack uh, for my two small pieces of software you'll find it why anybody would take the time to break a protection for a ten dollar piece of software that's a question that I cannot answer but I know that it's protected so there's a hack out there um, so just remember that as soon as your program will be out there in the world and it's protected there's a very 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 good chance that there will be a hacked version of it out there too so it's always a question of uh, cost versus benefits what is it going to cost you uh, in terms of money time complexity uh, management difficulty and what is it going to really benefit you in terms of okay I'm going to make more sales uh, is it really going to be the case or would the sale that you're going to do have been done anyway even if it was not protected uh, that's a question that you have to ask yourself by example you are selling a software for professionals only your software is uh, made for a very specific profession and uh, well you decide not to protect it what is going to happen well yes it's perfectly possible that somebody is going to give a copy of your software to a friend of his who is also a professional and that second professional is going to be in two possible cases he's able to deal with everything in your software by himself never need any uh, help any um, support and in that case you will never hear, hear about it and you have a copy out there that wasn't paid for now if the guy starts to use the software likes it and uh, well realize that one if he pays for it he will get support it will be deductible from his uh, taxes and he will not be liable to go to jail or to pay a huge uh, amount of money because he's using a hacked software well in that case there's a very good chance that he's going to buy the software once he used it for perhaps a few months and not protecting it will be the reason why uh, you sold the software uh, so it, it really depends on the situation you are in and uh, what it means for you to have your software out there but there's no uh, hard solution on that one it's really a question of thinking about it and finding something you feel comfortable with So let's start by the lawyer solution. First, uh, you need a license. With every piece of software that's going out there in the world, you need to have a license embedded in the installer and embedded in your software. Uh, because, well, once your software is installed somewhere, people can copy it without the installer. 
so you need to have the license directly in your software uh, in a help menu uh, in the help file um, perhaps in several places in the about window and so on so once your license is done uh, you can easily include it in several places don't hesitate to do that uh, it's harder for somebody to say I didn't see it when it's everywhere uh, there are examples of licenses, uh, software licenses everywhere. You probably have uh, 20 of them at least on your computer right now. Just by looking at the licenses that are on display when you install uh, WinDev, uh, Windows, um, Word, and so on. Uh, all these pieces of software come are coming with a license and you can look at it, see how it's done and do something like that. Um, license uh, are coming are going from extremely complex if you look at some of the Microsoft licenses uh, if you're not a lawyer uh, you're getting a headache that's for sure um, I don't know what you're getting if you're a lawyer but uh, I don't want to know um, and then you have some very simple license a few years back there was a famous no-nonsense license by Borland who basically was saying okay you have the right to use this software you have the right to copy it on another computer if you want as long as you don't use it on two computers at the same time so you can have it installed at home you can have it installed at work as long as you're the only one using it you're good to go basically it was saying a software is like a book uh, you can lend it to somebody but you cannot read it at the same time than somebody else that's all so uh, as you can see uh, there are very different schools out there um, what you need to do is stating in this document the ownership of the software the software belongs to you and nobody else and uh, nobody else has the right to modify it, to resell it, to and so on. And that's uh, the first thing. Then, what do you authorize? Do you authorize to copy it as a test? Do you authorize to um, install it on a second machine? Do you authorize to uh, do a backup of it, and so on and so forth? Um, what you don't authorize by example if you say uh, you don't have the right to make a backup of the, the original software because the software is always available on the website uh, and you can download it anytime okay perhaps it will work uh, remember one thing if your software if your software outlive your company your website won't be there and people will need a backup copy of their software so always think about what you are saying in this license are uh, with a uh, grain of salt this is uh, your first legal impact on the world and of course you have also to state where the lawsuit will happen if you have uh, somebody using a copy of your software illegal copy of your software of course on the other side of the world you don't want to have to make a lawsuit to him on the other side of the world you want to do it here at home he will have to come here to pay for it like that's going to happen well uh, anyway uh, that's the kind of thing that you're going to need to state in your license and um, that's about it uh, after that look at all the one that you have and see what you like and do something that looks like it uh, I personally prefer to have a license that is very simple in plain English or French depending of uh, who's the target and not in uh, lawyer language that nobody can understand um, and it looks like uh, some big companies are doing the same thing so it's probably uh, doable on a legal standpoint without too much trouble then you have the contract. The contract is uh, when you have a specific development with a company or even you are selling a software to a company and um, 
you are making a contract with uh, them for that. It's just not something that is downloaded from your website and paid on the web. You are going through a whole process of uh, contract negotiation, uh, sales, installation, uh, training, the whole nine yard. So in that contract, remember the requirement list. That's your first legal tool. There's perhaps not one word of law in the requirement list, but it is your first legal tool. If you don't have that and uh, the customer says, well, they told me that, I believe them, they are the professional, I'm not, the judge is going to rule in their favor most of the time. If you have a very strong requirement list signed by uh, the customer, you're good to go. So that's your first tool. Remember that you are the one in charge, you're the one doing the contract. Don't accept a contract general condition coming from your customer if you do not agree with the condition. Once it's signed, it's too late. Um, you are the software professional. You're the one who knows what's good and what's not good for the software. And remember that if documents and descriptions are inaccurate, it's on you. Again, you are the professional. You are the one in charge of doing all this in a, in a correct manner. The customer who is uh, selling toys doesn't know anything about software and cannot point out that this is incorrect when you are doing it. So the judge or jury will always give the preference to the, your customer. So you don't have the right to make mistakes in your contract. You don't want any surprise. The customer doesn't want any surprise either. So if your contract described everything from scratch, there is absolutely no reason for your customer not to like it. If you try to uh, have a very good contract complete with everything in it and the customer doesn't like it, perhaps it's one of those projects that you shouldn't do because well what reason could a customer have to refuse a contract that describes exactly everything that he asked for I see only one and you don't want to go there now you have the lawsuit okay the lawsuit is for some the uh, last thing that you want to do but uh, it's something that you do after the fact when somebody used illegal copies of your software. It's also uh, something where you can make money out of it. If you find a big company using your software uh, illegally, well, you can make much more money than if they had bought it in the first place. So uh, perhaps a lawsuit in some cases is a good thing. Of course, you first have to detect and identify who is using illegal copies of your software. So uh, uh, there are mechanisms to do that. By example, if your software, let's say, randomly on a timer, connects to the web, to your website, and basically pings you by telling you I'm IP this, I'm network card address, MAC address that, and I'm using version x.yz of your software. Well, if you have a licensing uh, schema where you have identified who is using your software, you can immediately see that this IP address and this um, MAC address are not listed. So suddenly you have detected somebody using your software and you don't know who that is. So of course you have to wait a little bit because it could be somebody who is testing your software if you have a trial version. But even your trial version could register and say I'm starting the trial, I'm IP this or that, I'm MAC address this or that. So at that point you have a computerized identity of somebody and you can use that to find out who's behind it. 
it's perfectly possible. You'll need a lawsuit. You need to first uh, ask the uh, internet access provider who's the customer. And once you have this information, you'll be able to either do it the kind way and saying, okay, you are using my software and you didn't pay for it. Uh, I give you a chance to uh, come clean and just buy the licenses. Or you can do it the hard way and say, okay, you have a lawsuit on your hand, you are using my software, you have been using it for the last six months, I have regular uh, ping from your uh, from your IP, I can prove it, and that's it. That's a possibility. Of course, that means that you have to code all that, uh, install all that in your software, that the firewall will let you do that, uh, that uh, you will have lots of condition to uh, meet in order for you to be able to do that. Is that something that is worth it? Perhaps, perhaps not. You will have to decide. It's really a question of how much time are you ready to spend on that to install all this protection system in the first place and how much can it uh, give you and it's a question that depends on your software on what it does and how many people will use it. I have an example uh, in France uh, architects are using massively one software one of them it's the one that everybody is using and it's a very expensive software well from what I've seen I haven't met a lot of architects but ne nearly all the ones that I've met are using uh, an illegal copy of the software because it's too expensive they just don't want to pay for it so um, perhaps if the price was lower they would make much more money. Uh, perhaps they should protect it much more than they do currently, but obviously the hacks are out there and everybody using them. And, well, it's a question, is it worth it to uh, go after all the your potential customer and have a, a police officer inspect the, the computers and find the hacked copy and it's a really a very vast question. Remember that you can get help. You're not alone uh, in that situation of course and uh, you can find on the web lots of models, templates, example of uh, license contracts uh, uh, and all this kind of thing. So it's perfectly doable. You also have association like the ASP, the Association of Shareware Professional. You're going in that uh, model of um, of uh, protection, uh, where you have, uh, as soon as you are a member, a whole lot of uh, information available. Uh, by example, you have the address of a group. Uh, forcing website with hacks to close, uh, you have uh, all these kind of things. So uh, you are not alone. If you want to go the lawyer way with or without a lawyer, uh, you can do that. Uh, it's not uh, very complex. Will it do a lot of difference? I don't know. I don't think that anybody can answer that. And if you see all the lawsuits and all the protection scheme out there, you can doubt it. Protecting your software by hard is certainly a possibility. Uh, let's have a look at what it implies. First, what is a dongle? A dongle is an basically an electronic board uh, with some read-write memory. This thing is uh, connected on a parallel port or USB port of your computer. Some of them are also a network uh, dongle and can be accessed 
over the network by several users so you can uh, use this kind of thing for a multi user license with only one dongle um, by example when you update your WinDev 11 to WinDev 12 you are going to update the dongle in fact it's just writing new information in it writing you have the right to use version 12 um, so each time you buy an update it comes with a specific piece of software made just for you for your license number that's why in all update they're asking for the license number of your key and they just generate this small executable who is going to write in the dongle and update it so uh, checking if a software is authorized means basically reading information in the dongle and checking its validity let's say that there's a string a saying uh, version 11 is allowed and then there are somewhere else a CRC verifying that this string is uh, correct something like that so the good thing about it is that there are W language instructions for that it's called HASP uh, it's the instructions that are uh, necessary to read and write in all the HASP key made by Aladdin software and by a strange coincidence HASP keys are the run used by WinDev um, which means that basically uh, you can read information in your own dongle yeah not so fast because of course information in the dongle is encrypted is protected so if you don't have the password matching your specific dongle you cannot read it or write in it in fact the way it works is that when you start on ordering uh, dongles from uh, HASP uh, you buy in fact a series of dongle all using the same password uh, so you can have one dongle for all your software or you can have one type of dongle per software with a different password uh, all that is possible of course uh, Aladdin software is making one of the dongles available in the market there are several others and uh, as they are not coming with a built-in instruction in WinDev they are coming with either an API so you call a DLL and you do what you have to do or for some of them they are also coming with an encapsulation schema and what that is is just an executable that wraps around your executable and does the protection thing look at the uh, dongle verify that it's correct and so on and if everything is alright then it will start your own executable so it's not difficult to use it's not difficult to put in place in your software but the cost is really not negligible uh, a dongle will cost uh, of course prices are very different depending on how many you are buying and the brand and model that you are buying but it can be something around 50 bucks for one dongle so of course if you are selling a $15 software that is not an option if you are selling a $10,000 software it's perfectly usable now the second problem is that of course it is hackable uh, if you can write in this uh, small uh, device with a small executable sent uh, to you when you are uh, paying for an upgrade it means that if you know how to write this small executable or if you know how to uh, look in it you will find what the password is and you will find how to uh, write things yourself and basically that's what some people did to uh, write hacks for uh, dongles you have available hacks for 
every dongle out there. And not only is it hackable, but it's basically already hacked before you put your software out there. Uh, to understand that, you have to understand how the hacks are working. In fact, you have two different big family of uh, cracking method for a dongle. The first one is the dongle emulator. That's a very, uh, very beautiful solution on a technical standpoint. What they did is they wrote a small piece of software that answer to request to a dongle as if it was a dongle. Basically in Windows you can emulate uh, nearly everything. You can emulate a hard drive, you can emulate a CD, a DVD, uh, a physical DVD as in fact a piece of a hard drive. You can emulate a dongle on a USB port. You just hook your uh, driver instead of the driver of the HASP key and then your software is going to talk with this software instead of talking to the uh, external hardware device. At that point of course you need to have in your dongle emulator the knowledge of what is in the key in order to uh, give the right answers. But you will find that uh, there is out there uh, hacks for nearly everything that is protect protected by dongle and uh, they give you the uh, thing to enter in your dongle emulator for uh, this version, that version, this software, that software. Nearly everything is available. The second uh, way of uh, cracking uh, dongle protection is to modify your software directly and uh, well it goes by uh, looking at your software, looking how it's done, how it's calling the dongle, where it's calling the dongle and then basically either removing the calls to the dongle or ignoring the false answer. In fact one of the simplest way to hack a software like that is to exchange the test by the contrary test. So if the dongle is absent, then the software works. If the, software, if the dongle was present, then the software wouldn't work. Uh, of course, to avoid that, uh, many software are multiplying the tests. They are doing that everywhere in the software. They are doing that um, randomly on the timers and things like that. It's harder to track. Uh, uh, with the debugger and uh, modify. Um, by example, WinDev 5.5, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, would test if the dongle was present when starting. After that, if you were to remove the dongle, uh, you would still be able to uh, use the WinDev uh, nearly normally. Now if you try to do that with the current version, it's going to stop working very fast because they are checking uh, much more regularly. So uh, this uh, means that uh, OK the dongle is a solution uh, and this protection is going to cost you money. It's simple to put in place and it's uh, not much more uh, reliable than any software solution. So that's uh, always the same thing. It will deter the uh, not so knowledgeable guy who's not really convinced that he has to use an illegal copy of your software. It will not stop the guy who really wants not to pay your soft and that guy anyway is not going to pay your soft. So of course there is also the uh, software external tool solution. Um, basically you have two big families of uh, system used by this uh, system. The first one uh, arrives as generally a DLL or set of DLLs and you add calls to your soft. You call the DLL and you um, 
just uh, follow the different uh, procedure they are giving you encode information, decode information, verify this, verify that uh, it's a set of tools that you add to your application uh, is it possible to crack that? well of course it is pos always possible by example to write another DLL called exactly the same way with the same functions a header in it and uh, just uh, this always return true to the verification and so on so uh, it's clearly something that you can overcome if you decided to do it the second type of uh, software that is available out there is a wrapper uh, in that case there is absolutely no modification uh, in your soft you don't add any calls anywhere these things is in fact uh, wrapping itself around your executable your executable is encrypted included in their executable and their executable is renamed with your name at that point each time you run it it checks what it has to check uh, which is, is there a license, uh, valid license, is the license of this computer and so on and uh, run your executable only if all the checks panned out uh, I tried, uh, I tested one of those, and in fact I'm using one of those uh, and so I know for a fact that it's working with WinDev you can find it on protexis.com uh, it's also the one that is uh, used uh, in the download.com uh, system so if you want to put your uh, software uh, WinDev develop software as a possible download on download.com and use their merchant system uh, it comes with this protection system and it's working perfectly fine with WinDev absolutely no problem um, it includes license uh, payment and management which means that in that particular system uh, you are not in charge of uh, payment you have a web page address for each software where people can uh, come uh, say how many license they want pay and that's it uh, they pay this company and this company is forwarding uh, the money minus of course their money in it because this is working with a percentage of the product price uh, taken by them uh, which means that this solution is okay for small software that you sell for 10 or 15 bucks they are taking a percentage on it okay they are managing the license, their uh, server is managing that, they are managing the payment you don't have to take care of any of that uh, people are buying and money is coming on your uh, account so it's a solution that I'm using I'm not saying that it's the solution that you should use I'm saying that this one is tested working with WinDev uh, I don't have any money coming my way if you decide to use it so uh, if you have other ones that you are using that are working too we'll be happy to hear about it um, the good thing about that system is that you can set up uh, this system for any software in uh, less than an hour uh, basically what you do is tell them okay I have a new software I want to protect once you've opened an account with them of course and uh, you give the name, you give a few information, you upload the non-protected executable without the DLLs, just the executable and uh, you download the protected executable uh, this executable is about 2 megabytes bigger than your original one and includes your uh, executable encrypted um, and that's it after that you create your installer with that uh, bigger executable instead of yours and you're done um, of course when you s run the executable uh, there are verification on the machine is the license installed uh, paid and so on if not you have a window uh, popping up uh, saying uh, do you want to uh, 
order now, to buy now, or just uh, use it as a trial. And the trial-based system is a time limitation. You can decide that uh, people can use on a machine this software for <coughs> two weeks, a month, uh, whatever time you choose uh, uh, valid. After that, each time they are starting the program, they will just have the choice to buy it. So that's how it works. Uh, it works fine. You have to know that. So it adds two megabytes to the size of your executable. The the, it's their code. Uh, you also have to know that it adds a delay each time the soft s starts between one and two seconds. Um, it's basically the time that it takes for them to uh, check everything, um, encrypt your executable, extract it, start it, um, and that's about it. Uh, so if it's okay for you to have one or two second delay when you run the executable, have it a little bigger and pay a percentage on each sale, you have a system that works, um, that isn't uh, complex to put in place, and uh, create uh, nearly no problem. They have their own support, so when you have a, a customer uh, losing the hard drive uh, and contacting you, you tell them, they reactivate this uh, particular license so the user can install again, and that's it. It's working fine. There's no really problem. Um, are these, these solutions safer than a dongle? Absolutely not. Uh, there are cracks available for all the, protect, the known protection tools out there. Uh, my own software protected with this wrapper is available as a crack on the web. I looked. So, um, yes, it's a 10 bucks software where people took the time to create a crack. Uh, there's no limit to what people can do. So, um, cracks are available in every case. There is no uh, doubt about that. Um, so, uh, is that a better solution than a dongle? Well, it's certainly less expensive. Uh, it's very easy to set up. It offers a certain level of protection. Um, if you find that level of protection acceptable, it also uh, gives you a web payment solution that you don't have to set up, that you don't have to manage, where you just have to get the money coming on your, uh, on your account. So it's a solution that has a certain number of advantages that you can think about. Is it a final solution against uh, illegal copy? Absolutely not. We already know that there's none that is an absolute protection. And we arrive to the part that I'm sure you were all waiting for. How to protect your software with your software. Let's see first what are the uh, different arguments against using that solution. You have to code it. It takes time and time is money. So this is going to cost you perhaps quite some time and quite some money to implement. And you are not a protection specialist, which means that uh, well, perhaps your protection will not be as good as uh, what you could have with an outside tool being soft or hard or a mix of the two. Now the pros. You can code as little or as much as you want. You are not uh, uh, obliged to follow a schema designed by somebody else. So you can really do many, many things very simple um, that perhaps are enough in your case. Or code something extremely complex if you need to. So you can adapt the protection level to the need of not only you in general, but that specific project. Clearly, uh, a small software sold for 10 bucks doesn't need the same level of protection than um, a software that you sell for $10,000 or 
or that you uh, rent for 50 bucks per user per month that's not the same thing uh, you can, if you call it yourself, fully integrate the protection, the license management, the payment solution, all that can be done uh, internally and with your own software, really manage the way you want. It can be done via a website or it can be done via software in your company, doesn't matter, but you can manage all that. By example, uh, you have uh, customers uh, who are using uh, groups of license. What they are using, they are buying you uh, each time 50 or 20 uh, license by block. And they are using uh, 200, 300 licenses like that in their company. Well, uh, clearly when uh, an employee leaves, and uh, another one comes in they need to be able to transfer a license the new guy perhaps is not going to use the computer of the old guy perhaps he's in another part of the building perhaps he's not doing the same job but is using the same software so how do you do that if you uh, deal with that with an external uh, solution it's going to be uh, hard to manage in an uh, easy way now, if you are doing it yourself, you can have a license management schema where, well, from the software itself, they can, um, they can remove the license, freeing the license to be used by somebody else. You can also uh, say, okay, this hardware just died on us, we need to reinstall it, so you can reactivate uh, this license and uh, they can say okay now uh, we are renting you the software uh, we had uh, 175 users we are reducing the workforce we need only 150 now so now uh, you have to manage the fact that they are going to pay only for less and that the keys the license the way that you are managing that uh, is not going to allow them to still use 175 licenses so all that uh, are things that uh, you can manage yourself it's not even that complicated uh, it's perfectly uh, doable and we're going to see in much more detail how to do that but um, it's certainly a situation where an internal uh, license management schema with an integrated protection is a much better idea so Clearly, you can uh, integrate a very complex solution uh, if you call it yourself. Also, you don't have to pay the outside solution. Uh, I'm very happy to pay my uh, percentage of the sale on uh, each sale for 10 or 15 bucks software. Because I don't have to manage anything, I don't have to code anything, it saves me time, they are doing the management, their server, their solution, their support. I don't have anything to do after my software is built. Uh, so clearly on uh, in that case for me it's a great solution. Uh, now if I start to have uh, 20,000 uh, licenses out there for this software which is not the case currently, uh, perhaps I'm going to start thinking okay I'm giving them quite a lot of money Perhaps I could code that and uh, save that money. So it's it's a question really of give and take. Is the price uh, good enough for the solution, and or is it too expensive, or do you want to make more money, and are you ready to work for it? And clearly, uh, if uh, you're using an outside solution, you rely on somebody else. So what will happen in the future you don't know. Is the support of this solution going to be good enough, uh, fast enough? Uh, if the company who is providing the solution just disappear, what happened to your software and what happened to all your existing customers who are using that? Uh, what will be the evolution of this software in the future? Will it work on the next version of uh, Windows? And so on and so forth. 
Uh, another problem can be that their solution is working under Windows and when you want to um, make a Java version of your software for a Mac they don't have anything for you. Another problem can be that well Protexis by example is working only in English language. Their web page can work only in English and uh, in dollars. That's it. They don't know how to uh, pay in euros, they don't know how to have a page in French. Uh, so it can be a problem. So outside solutions are what they are and perhaps they will not adapt to uh, what you will need tomorrow. A good thing is that as every protection is breakable your protection is breakable but not much more than theirs. As I told you I'm using a tool made by what is supposed to be a protection specialist but my software is out there as a crack. Uh, so their protection in the final perhaps it took more time for the uh, uh, the hacker to um, crack their protection and perhaps it will take more time to crack mine because it's in WinDev so it's interpreted, it's not visible the same way, it's not something that they are used to, you don't know that. But uh, all protection are crackable so well, doesn't make that big of a difference if you code it or not so it's I put that in the pro list. Now, when is it worth it to code your protection system yourself? Um, well, clearly it's when the advantages exceed the price. And by price, I don't mean just the money you have to pay uh, somebody for their uh, system protection. It's uh, the price that uh, you're going to pay anyway when you code the time that you spend and the money that you're not making during this time. So, uh, also, it's when there is no solution out there that is practical for you. By example, if uh, you do need an outside solution that works with WinDev, um, you don't want to pay for the hardware, so it's a software solution, and you need one that works in several languages, well, Protexis is not for you. They're working only in English. So, uh, is there another one that will work with WinDev? there's a very good chance that yes, but you will have to test. Um, so, um, that's one case, of course, there, there can be the case where you want to integrate this uh, protection uh, in your license management and be able immediately when you have a customer online to activate, deactivate license and you need a much more powerful feature than uh, is available out there. So uh, it's really when what you need is not available or not easily available or not practical or was too expensive compared to what you're doing. The principle of the uh, protection schema is quite simple. In fact, things don't work if some conditions are not met. That's the end of it. So, of course, uh, you have to define what conditions and you have to, con to define what are the things that will not work at all, partially, or not the same way. Let's look at the type of limitations that you can uh, set up in your software. The first is extremely binary. Nothing works. Either you pay or else nothing works at all. Um, if you do that, you lose the possibility to have a trial version of your software, which can be a very useful tool to sell uh, your software. So um, that's probably not the best way to go. But if that's what you want to do, of course, you can do it. Um, you can work on the duration of uh, the software. How long is it going to work? That's the uh, the admitted principle in the shareware world. Um, shareware is supposedly a software that will work f fully uh, for a certain amount of time defined by the other. 
uh, a shareware is not a shareware if you limit the functionalities that's the definition so uh, what kind of duration can you uh, set up well you could uh, put in place something that says okay your software will run for 10 minutes and then it will close automatically so that's just a timer not not very hard to do uh, you could even say that you don't even implement a real protection schema you have two versions one that stops every 10 minutes and one that doesn't that's uh, that can be as basic as that um, after that you have the uh, the possibility to say okay the uh, software is going to work for 30 days by example in that case you need first to uh, of course choose that amount of time then you need to identify the first start of the software basically it's when you don't have the information when it was started before you need to store that information in a way that will prevent the user to change it and then uh, you have to compare each time you start your software or each time you start a module in your software or every 10 minutes in your software or whatever of course the difficult part in that is to be able to uh, get that information reliably because of course the old trick of changing the date on a computer is uh, still alive uh, you have to store that information in a way that will prevent the user to delete it, remove it, uh, modify it and so on and then you have to check it in a way that is not easily identifiable by uh, a hacker with a debugger in hand so uh, let's take a few of these points uh, first how do you uh, check that the date is valid obviously the first time you uh, do that you can't but you can check that the date is valid uh, all the time you can check that um, well let's take an example the user before starting your software put the date in 2010 and say this way 30 days it will be in 2010 I have three years to use it well okay but then when you start using the software and you're doing say an invoice it needs to enter the correct date for the invoice at least a, a date that is uh, this year well if you don't accept a date that is lower than the starting date of your program your program is protected um, then uh, you have the case where uh, the user had the correct date at the beginning and after 20 days is going or 30 days is going to go back in time in his computer and set it to uh, 30 days ago well okay but again if you are using any type of data that contains and needs to contain a valid date like uh, an invoice then you can compare that the new invoice that has been created is with the date that is at least equal or greater than the previous one and that is not 30 days more than the starting date in fact you can even not store any specific date just compare the date of the first invoice and the last one and if they are more than 30 days apart say okay that's the end of it so there are many different ways of uh, dealing with this kind of uh, problem it, once again it depends of your um, your software if you have valid date information needed in a data file it's something if you don't then you need to store the first date uh, in something that is encrypted of course uh, safe somewhere uh, it can be just uh, a data file that comes with your application and um, needs to be uh, in a certain encrypted uh, way and then when you uh, check the date you verify that it's not more than 20 days after but it's not also coming back so each time you store a new information the first date and the last date that has been used if now you go back in time even one day you stop the you stop the validity of the software so many many different ways to do that and uh, we'll go into more details when we start to look at the code by itself 
then you have the case of uh, saying okay I want it to work only uh, 20 times 20 start of the program and it will stop uh, working um, again you're going to uh, store somewhere the fact that it has been started once and then a second time and then a third time and so on so uh, clearly if that information can be deleted then you're starting back to uh, 0, 1 or not so you have to check that the information was not deleted by doing some kind of operation uh, either include that number of execution in something that uh, cannot be deleted without the program not working anymore um, like adding it at the end of a DLL um, adding it in a file that needs to be here and is and is installed with everything at the beginning and if you delete it you have also to uh, re-enter all the information about the company and this and that so there are many many different ways then you have the possibility to uh, say that your program will work in part only so you're not in the shareware world per se uh, exactly but many shareware in fact work that way too uh, by example everything works except printing and if you don't want to test and do this and do that you can just have a version where you remove the printing code and uh, that's your test version of course you will still need to protect the full version but uh, it's often easier to have only one version for that, this kind of thing um, you can have uh, also uh, something that works very well which is to limit the amount of information that you can enter in your software uh, something like QuickBook by example which is uh, very well known uh, has a QuickBook uh, Express, Express Start Edition free and limited to 20 customers in fact it's not even 20 customers it's 20 names so it doesn't matter if they are customer, uh, providers, uh, whatever as soon as you enter 20 named entities you have to buy the new version so you start using it you like it you continue to use it when you're at 20 you buy you don't like it uh, you use something else and clearly uh, you're not going to delete a customer to enter a new one so it's kind of a good way of uh, doing that for all programs that have uh, data in them now is it a meaningful test to have only 20 uh, named entities yes no perhaps it depends on your application uh, another thing to you can do is by example you have a backup software and uh, well your backup software is working perfectly except that it will backup every other file or one file on three or all the files depending of which time it starts and and so on so you can test it but you cannot do any meaningful work with it then you can add functions to your uh, test trial version by example you can print trial version in bold in the middle of the invoice uh, with an angle uh, which means that the guy will never be able to send that invoice to anybody uh, without being a laughing stock um, also you can use the nag screens nag screens is a screen that is going to be displayed either when the program starts when the program stops or even during the program randomly saying you are using the trial version of my super duper software and uh, you currently uh, used it for only uh, 10 days you still have 20 days to use it and you will not be able to close that uh, screen till I'm finished speaking uh, this kind of thing exists in many software uh, again it's up to you to see what you want to do mm, the type of condition that you can apply are also uh, 
dependent on what you want to do and the type of software you're using. By example, uh, some type of encrypted information must match a CRC. What does that mean? Well, by example, you get the name and address of the customer. He has to enter that in a, in a window. You also get an ID of the machine, which can be hard drive ID, a MAC address, um, several things like that. And uh, you send all that to uh, an email address or uh, a website that send back a CRC calculated by the, uh, the system. This, of course, is added to a license key that is sent at the same time. So you have now a license key matching this information and a CRC. And uh, you encrypt all that. You store that uh, on the machine. And regularly you decrypt and you check. Does the CRC match the name, the address and the ID of the machine? Is the ID of the machine matching the real ID of the machine? Um, then, of course, you can also use the encrypted information uh, to display on uh, screens, prints, and so on. You can have that in the uh, main application title, main window title, uh, uh, register to uh, that name, that address, or even on prints on, uh, on the side of the print, or in small, or at the bottom, and so on. So you have many different ways of doing that. Uh, you can also encrypt the starting date and uh, the current date. And if the difference between the two is less than 30 days, then the program can work. If not, and you don't have the uh, registration information available, then the program cannot work. Then uh, you can also encrypt the number of execution and test if it's less than 20. Each time you get some information, encrypt it, hide it somewhere and um, test it. It's always the same type of uh, system. Now uh, a second thing that you can do is that this encrypted information that you have on the machine must match uh, some information that you have on your web server. Of course, that implies that you have a web server that you use for that, with a software on it, and uh, that it's accessible by your program uh, regularly. Perhaps not each time the program is started, but each 5, 10 times, 20 times. Is that acceptable for your software? Uh, well, if it's a software that is uh, replicating data uh, using the web, absolutely. If it's a software that is regularly accessing the web for some other reason, uh, yes, too. Now, if it's a small software that is totally standalone, uh, doesn't need anything outside uh, except checking for the uh, validity of the license, will it be acceptable for the user to have this uh, obligation to be connected to the web? Well, no. Clearly, uh, not everybody is connected to the web and not everybody will be. So, if you use this kind of schema on a software that doesn't need uh, intrinsically to uh, access the web, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Now, if uh, you can do that, of course, it's much more effective because now uh, it, it must also match an active license and you just open the door to the license management that we are talking about before. Um, it must also match a license that is not already in use, which means that even if they were able to copy the software uh, with the same license key, install it on several machines, this machine will never be able to be uh, used at the same time. Now that's interesting because it means that the same license could be installed at home and at the office, but the software wouldn't be able to be used on both at the same time. And that's one solution uh, of the problem saying, okay, I want to be able to work at home, I want to be able to work from the office, I don't want to buy two licenses, I'm the only guy using it. 
no problem sir just use the same license key on both we'll store the two uh, the two machine ID where it's authorized each time you use the software regularly during the use it will check the license it's very fast it's in a secondary thread it won't bother you and well if you start to use it on one machine then the the secondary machine where it was used before will uh, stop working perfectly possible of course you can combine several limitations by example um, you can have your software uh, working fully for 30 days and then after 30 days uh, start to uh, let's say back up one file uh, on every four files or uh, you can have uh, either 20 execution or 30 days whichever come first or last it all depends on you of course what you want to do and how you want to deal with it remember one thing there is no protection that is not breakable so you can spend a lot of time, a lot of time protecting your software, doing all sorts of crazy things. If your software goes out there in the world and is not limited to two installs, there will be a crack at some point. It's amazing how fast this kind of thing happen. Of course, you can also combine several control means. You can check if the date is not too long, but also check on the server if uh, the, the license is active. That's, uh, by example, a way to uh, check that the license has been paid every month if you are renting your software. Um, you can have the software uh, needs to reactivate every month by checking your, your your server so you are counting the days and when it's the first of the month then you are going on the server to check by example remember one thing it's generally a bad idea to block too much if you are um, providing a trial version uh, you want that trial version to be usable if the user is blocked all the time by your protection schema he will say this uh, software is a pile of crap I'm not buying that and he will delete it or not but he will not pay for it that's for sure the user trying your software needs to have a good experience so don't block too much um, remember also one thing by law in many countries after trial time data that was entered during the trial time still needs to be accessible what does that mean it means that uh, if you are uh, working on uh, invoicing software well during the trial you can do everything after the trial okay perhaps you cannot print the the, the invoices but you can still see it and perhaps also you can still export them uh, in order for them to be usable in something else but at least you still n you still need to be able to uh, look at your data on the screen that's a minimum uh, the same way if you are writing a backup software then uh, after the 30 days you cannot backup anymore but you can still restore if you don't do that uh, you will be uh, an outlaw in many countries so uh, be careful of course you can never uh, match the um, the laws of all the countries in the world but you can uh, safely bet that uh, if you're not reasonable in your uh, blocking you're going to end up in trouble there's another thing that you have to consider if uh, you let the user try a software for five days it won't have a lot of time during those five days to do that the guy is not paid to use the software so he will use it when he finds the time if you are limiting your software to uh, 30 days or 60 days then there's a good chance that he will have the time to work on it seriously and enter a lot of data 
if he enters a lot of data uh, in it, when the time comes where he cannot enter anymore and he cannot use it anymore, then there's a very good chance that he will buy it because he doesn't want to lose all his work. If you don't give the user enough time to uh, work with your software in a meaningful way, then there's no real reason for him to uh, buy it afterwards. Just try it two times and it doesn't work anymore. Okay, that's the end of it. Uh, forget about it. Now uh, you have to think about your update mechanism. If you are writing a software and you know that you are going to very regularly uh, publish updates because you have a list of uh, planned new function that is as long as uh, the phone book and you plan to add one function every two month minimum and we're not even talking about debugging because of course you're going to debug your software along the way and uh, create patches and so on so if you uh, deal with your update mechanism yourself this can be part of your protection schema well because just uh, first of all if they use a cracked version each time they're going to uh, install a new version on top of it they will need to have a cracked version of that one too or they will not be able to use the new functions the new um, possibilities uh, let's take an example of somebody using a cracked version of Windows 5.5 as long as they are not a cracked version of Windows 7 available, well, they can do anything about it and they cannot uh, use the Windows 7 without uh, paying for it. So uh, the fact that you have a new version uh, regularly, uh, in the case of PCsoft it's more like every year, but you can count the intermediate updates too, uh, you're using a cracked version when there's a bug and you cannot do anything about it because there is no cracked version with the correct one so um, update mechanism can definitely be a part of your protection schema on that aspect also well uh, clearly uh, the update shouldn't work on a cracked version so if you are coding it yourself you can include testing um, during the update and refuse to update because you can't find information that can be totally different than the information that is used to protect the software every day. So now the hacker has to crack a second layer of protection. Your database can also be a part of your protection schema. Think about it. There are many mechanisms in a database that you can use uh, in that uh, aspect. First, we already talked about the fact that you use the uh, data dates uh, to uh, make comparison and make limitation. Uh, if you have more than 60 days of data in the data file, then uh, you stop working. Um, clearly, uh, the user are not going to delete all their data in order to be able to enter more data. It doesn't make sense. Then, you can also include some protection mechanism uh, in some stored procedure if you're using this kind of thing. Now suddenly the uh, the protection to crack is not in the executable anymore it's on the server, it's uh, in the file engine, it's in the database by itself. So uh, it doesn't mean it's not crackable, it just means that you are uh, using different means uh, of protection and that the hacker will have to go through all these different ways in order to uh, unprotect your software. So basically you can try to block illegal copy but you can also try to detect illegal users and uh, if you detect illegal users if you are able through the update mechanism by example or through um, any kind of a connection that the software needs to do uh, if you are able to uh, detect that a copy that is used is not a licensed one then you can detect its IP address you can detect um, its 
uh, MAC address, uh, record all that, and afterwards eventually find the people and uh, tell them, okay, we know that you're using uh, illegal copy, you have the choice between uh, buying your copy now or uh, facing a lawsuit. And this could directly be part of your uh, update mechanism, by example. If you're able to detect in your update mechanism that uh, you are uh, in fact dealing with an illegal copy, then your update mechanism could download this uh, information instead of downloading this, the, the new version. And you have this beautiful window that pops up on the screen that says you are using an illegal copy. To buy it, click on that button. Uh, to uh, get a lawsuit, just close the window. That is probably something that is going to make a few people think. So, of course, again, it depends on your uh, software and what it does. And if you are able, when you uh, develop your software, to include in your software a very interesting function that needs to connect to your server, mm, let's say an update of uh, part information. You are uh, building an application that is used in a very specific profession and where you have regularly uh, the new um, list of parts, the new list of products, the new list of things that are available from uh, this provider, that provider and that you enter directly on your server and it's automatically updated in the software. It's a very interesting feature. So are they going to disable that feature one way or another, not use it? Yes, it's possible. But if they try to use it only once and they don't have a license, you can detect it and you can send down this uh, wonderful information saying, hello, we got you. We have your IP address we know who you are or we can get it very easily so now it's time to pay or face a lawsuit at this point you know everything about the protection in theory but of course as usual I created a project to show you in uh, detail how you can implement that in your own project and yes there is a class that comes with the project and you will have most of the mechanisms that you need to protect the project already built into this class. The first thing we're going to do is to do a little demonstration on how things uh, work for the user, for you, and everything in the real life. So let's have a look at this WDPFLED project. Here we are. Um, I created uh, that project to, in order to have everything in the same place. Of course, some things that we're going to do here are uh, things that will happen on the customer side, like this step one. This is your customer asking for a registration. And things, some things will happen on your side, like the step two, uh, that is you or your server managing it. We're going to look at all that more in detail. As you can see, uh, suddenly, after a few seconds, a trial version invoice will tell message appeared on the window. That's because I'm using the principle I told you about uh, in the theoretical part of this session uh, with a timer uh, managing uh, the call of the uh, protection schema. And in order not to have that uh, timer do only that, I'll f in fact have a timer that is managing the display of time in the window and from time to time in that timer there is some more code that is going to call the protection schema. That's one way of hiding uh, the protection schema calls in the middle of your regular code. Of course we'll look at that code in details in, uh, in the end of that uh, session. So. We are on the customer machine and the customer wants to uh, register the software. So he comes on that screen. On that screen he has to enter his name or the name of his company. So let's say that I'm entering my name and my address. Okay.
let's say it's on my full address and as you can see in the field below automatically some information uh, was displayed uh, obviously in a real product you don't have to display information and probably you don't want to display this information because it gives too much indication of what is used to protect the system but just to give you an example of what the class that you will get is able to do this is the MAC address on this computer so you already have a code written for you that gives you that information this is the name of the computer in the network this is the IP address in the network this is the name of the user on this machine and this is the information about the, the system so if we are using that uh, sum of information the whole thing uh, as a key in the protection uh, schema it means that if the user change his network card, change his IP address, change the name of his machine, the name of the user on the machine, or even upgrade his system to, uh, let's say, Vista, then the license will automatically expire. That's perhaps a little too stringent for most cases, but it just gives you an example of what you can do. It will be up to you to decide to what level you want to um, deal with the modification of the machine. Well, once the user has entered his information and the system has already taken the information that you want to identify the machine, the next step is to prepare for transport and record. What that does mean? Well, obviously you're currently on the user machine and you need to send all that information uh, to the main computer that you're using for the registration process. It can be a simple computer on your machine, it can be uh, a server, a web server that you have. Uh, you have many ways of transporting this information as we already saw. Um, you can use an HTTP request and have a web server or you can just send automatically an email to a specific email address that you're using only for that and have your uh, application on your machine checking that email address every uh, minute or five minutes or whatever you want and at the same time preparing an answer for your customer with the ID of the customer, the name of the customer, whatever uh, unique ID, the MAC address of the customer by example in the, uh, type, the, the header of the message and have then your application check in the same exact uh, mailbox if there is an answer uh, for this specific registration request. That's one way of doing it that rec needs only uh, one email address. Uh, so you can do that in a, in a very light way without needing any resources. I didn't code the protection schema because it will depend of many factors that you uh, will have to decide on. Uh, and anyway, you still have a few uh, works to do uh, in your protection schema. I didn't want to do all the job for you after all. But still, we need to take this information and prepare it for the transport. And by preparing, here is what I mean. So you click on that prepare for transport and record. It calls a specific function in my uh, protection class. And as you can see, I end up with an encoded string with all this information in it. All this has been encoded. If I change only one uh, letter uh, in my address and I do that again, look at the uh, transport content, it's totally different there's not one byte that is identical. So this is a strong encryption schema that is used here and as you can see also there is a begin and a end string in that transport mechanism. This is because you can in fact just take this information, put it in an email, that's also why the string is cut in short segment in order not to be cut uh, in the email transport itself just copy and paste that in an email, send that to the server and you're good to go. So it's already done. If you don't need uh, the, fa the string to be cut in parts the way it's done there, well, it doesn't matter because, well, uh, it's not going to introduce any more complexity in your code, it's already coded. So let's say that the string has been prepared, uh, you have used your chosen mechanism of transport to send that to your server, and you're going to the step two, you're on the server, you just received your, uh, your information. So we're going to come here, 
select all that I'm going to do a copy of that go here do a paste okay I just received this information from a customer or potential customer and at the same time the guy paid me for a license what license well uh, let's say it's a license for WD protected uh, for uh, one user using the protection schema and the update schema it can be whatever string you want to that will describe what the user can do and cannot do in his software um, obviously uh, you can encode uh, a schema uh, saying okay 15 uh, concurrent user it's perfectly possible or you can say okay it's one user only license and it's tested on each machine or it's tested only on the server you can do whatever you want you are the one implementing the system so this is really your information that's the information we are talking about in also a dongle protection schema where there would be something by example in your windev dongle saying well you can use every version of windev uh, up to version 11 and when you will buy the version 12 upgrade then this information will be changed to say every version of windev up to 12 for one user on the machine where the dongle is isn't made it's exactly the same principle you are saying here what the user can or cannot do you can say here that uh, they can use the billing but not the accounting or whatever uh, whatever you you want exactly once we have this we are going to use another function of the class uh, to ask for the corresponding key let's try to do that get key and as you can see at the same time here I have a trace window that appeared that tells me what was extracted from the received information and you can see name uh, address and information MAC address name and so on so I'm using absolutely everything and all that was coming from here you can also see that the uh, formatting of the the information is name in uppercase equal address uh, and so on info in uppercase equal this is a string that is formatted using my CLPRAM class that is also included in this project and allows you to uh, very easily store multiple information in a memo field extract multiple information from a memo field and uh, store that information very easily in a parameter file that is also included in that uh, project so you will be able to use not only the protection mechanism but also the uh, parameter uh, storing and uh, retrieving mechanism that is uh, given here so we have now this wonderful key uh, that looks a lot like the kind of key that you have for the Microsoft's uh, protection schema by example and there's a very good reason for that they're doing the exact same thing I'm not saying that they're using the same encryption they are they're storing the same information but basically uh, every protection schema is working the same way so you have here a protection schema that tells the and use a machine that it can do this or that or not do this or that and of course once this key has been created and this can be done automatically on your server without you uh, moving one finger you have to prepare the answer so again it's uh, information that has to be sent back to the customer and we have uh, the mechanism already in place the mechanism we use to send information to the server is going to be used to uh, send information back so if we prepare the answer we can by example send the answer by email and generate automatically an email uh, saying dear Fabrice Harari well we know the name guy because well it's the information that was requested in the in the protection schema and then we have a nice text saying that the information there you can copy and paste this whole email and you have this now very well known uh, transport string with all the information we want to send back at that point we do not want to send back the name address and information about the machine the user uh, part of the protection schema has already stored all that on the machine 
So when we are sending back the information, we are just sending back what license we are authorizing and the corresponding protection key, which means that anybody intercepting that uh, answer email will not get the first part of the information and the second part of the information will therefore be totally unusable. That's just another little trick to uh, uh, increase the protection level. So now we have this answer that has been uh, created and we are sending it, by example, via email to the customer. Uh, let's say that I'm doing just a copy and paste here, but that's in fact uh, an email that was sent and the user received the email. And now we have the third step of the protection. The user receives registration, go in the registration window of your application and just paste his information in it. It could be also that uh, the application itself checked the email address automati automatically, the mailbox, and uh, retrieved that information uh, directly without the user doing anything. It's up to you to impl implement it the way you want. Uh, and then the user click on registration. Thank you. As a register, you are, you are entitled to and uh, you are going to tell the user what he can or cannot do. You can see at this point that here my trial version invoice will tell didn't change up to now. It's again because the protection schema is called only every few seconds. In this example, I think I'm doing that every uh, 9 seconds maximum. It's a random number between 1 and 9, or 1 and 19, I don't remember. Uh, a random number, again, in order for each time to have something different, to uh, amuse a little more the hackers. And clearly, in your real protection schema, you can use something that is longer than that, 2-3 minutes, uh, without uh, any problem, only that the uh, user will not be able to use his registration uh, registered version fully uh, the uh, first time he registers for 2 or 3 minutes, which is uh, totally possible. Uh, so it's up to you to, the, to find out which uh, amount of time you want to allow or not the uh, registration to be taken in account. So that's the whole process of the registration that you just saw here and we're now going to have a look at the code that is uh, behind that, that, you're, that, the code that you're going to be able to use in your own software. Let's talk quickly about how the uh, protection information is stored on the client side by example and could be also stored of course on the server side. I'm using a parameter file. It's a hyperfile uh, file in that particular case. It could be, of course, any type of file in your database. It's called, in that example, fhparam in order for you to be able to integrate it in your own project without uh, entering in conflict with anything else that would be called already param. Um, the system I'm using and I've been using for uh, more than 10 years now is very simple. Uh, I have a composite key made of a group and inside that group a uh, parameter uh, name. That is uh, basically the uh, system that you have in any type of INA file and clearly I've done that in order to be able to replicate this kind of functionality that you have in INA read and INA write. Uh, if we take the example of the protection, I'm storing one uh, record in the parameter file and of course you can store as many parameters as you want for your application. And if I'm doing a read here of the, uh, the protection information, here is what I have. I have my name equal, my address equal, info equal, license, the license information that is uh, stored here after receiving information, the corresponding key and the date. This date is being used of course to uh, find out if uh, the information doesn't match the machine, if there was a registration at some point or if it's just that is a trial version. Uh, the system I'm using allows to read the whole thing, the whole parameter value based on this uh, composite key, but it also allows to access directly uh, any type of sub-parameter inside that main one. So if by example here I want to read just the key value, 
I do this and the class, the CLPRM class that is uh, inside that project will automatically retrieve for you not only the full parameter but extract from it the value of it. So if I'm using another one, not the projection one, but uh, another one here, um, well, no, let's let's work on the protection. Okay, protection, uh, and I change anything in this. Uh, let's have it. here. Okay, I have the uh, I have this key, and in this key, I'm changing A to B and writing it. Uh, in the next few seconds, when there's a new test on the uh, the protection schema, I will have this message changing to something saying that uh, it's not uh, a protected version. But as you can see, if I read, so here we are, export license. This software will work in degraded mode only, uh, with two wonderful uh, error in the message. Uh, this must have been tired when I was writing this one but you understand the principle. So here the only information that changed was one letter here and uh, now I have a message that is even different than the one we had at the beginning. Uh, it's not a trial version, it's expired license. Well that's because now we have some information in there with the date saying that at some point this uh, software was registered which means that if the information doesn't match the uh, license expired one way or another. Uh, so you have to contact your now your technical support to renew your license. And as you can see, all that is done with just uh, just one function. As you can see also here, I have in that info uh, sub-parameter uh, parameters that are separated by carriage return. And all that is stored directly in the uh, file you can see that the carriage return have been replaced by this string which is obviously the only string that is not allowed to be stored in a parameter and all this mechanism is already there working for you you can use it to store any type of information in uh, any case for your general parameter management in your project this tab is there only to show you how it works and to let you play with it and see what you can do with it We are now going to have a look at the insides, the plumbing of the protection schema I used in that uh, particular example. Um, if you have a look here, you will see that I still have my CL project class that you already saw in different things, CLDB class in order to manage database, CLPRM class is the class I was just talking about that is managing all these parameter things and CL protect is the class containing everything in the protection schema uh, system. Uh, of course we'll go in detail over, over how the uh, protection is working on an object oriented point of view in the uh, object oriented course that will happen later today. Uh, what we're going to look at here is only what is inside the class. So for now, just bear with me. Uh, don't think about any kind of object problem. Just think about the protection schema. Think of it as a collection of procedure if you feel more comfortable with that. Uh, it's only the functionality that is important currently, not the form in which it was coded. The first thing that we're going to have a look at is the project uh, code itself. As you can see, it's very uh, clean, very small. What do we have? We are declaring a CL project uh, object in order to manage all the project necessities. Um, then we are declaring a CLDB, general object that will be used everywhere to access the data. Then we are declaring a parameter object that allows us to use all these parameter functionalities. And finally, we are declaring the protection system. So there is absolutely nothing in there that has any type of information that can be used, even if the uh, the hacker knows that uh, he can see all this code in clear in the header of any uh, WinDev executable. What we need to have a look at currently is the init protect method in the uh, protection system. As you can see, there's not a lot of things to init. We are just here 
doing this random 929 this is what I'm using to um, call the protection schema randomly from my timer I'm doing that in intervals that are uh, randomly selected each time the program starts between 9 and 29 seconds you can of course do that with any type of interval between 1 minute and 3 minutes or whatever you want or between 1 and 5 seconds uh, don't spend too much time checking the protection it will slow down everything don't spend too little time checking the protection it will uh, make the copy more easy so it's up to you to see so that's all there is in the initialization code and after that everything else is in the class and the window we're going to look at things in the logical of the the, the order that we um, dealt with in the demonstration so the user is entering his name his address and this uh, information is already uh, in it how do we have this information well in the initialization of the field the only thing I did was to call the protection class and to get the computer information from it that particular method is in charge of uh, returning everything from the uh, computer the MAC address, the machine name network user, Windows version as you can see the last four are uh, native WinDev methods the MAC address didn't exist so I coded it and gave you here uh, information about uh, how to deal with it as you can see it's fairly simple but is it's using an API call in order to retrieve this information so that's all there is to it uh, you can look at it in detail if you want uh, there's nothing really complex in it but the good thing is it's coded it's working you don't have to deal with that at all if you don't want to um, let's close this and that and look again at uh, what we have here so once we have all this information we have to prepare the string for transport and the call is done in this button in that particular case uh, you will call it from wherever you want in your project uh, again uh, remember how you are supposed to work so you have all these commands here uh, to let you know what is supposed to happen so format information to allow for easy extraction both here and on the server side so what are we doing declaring a string and then using this parameter class to write a line in the parameter line that starts with name equal and containing the name of the uh, user another one with the address and another one after that with all the information coming from the field the uh, param class is dealing with that directly you don't have anything to do the whole formatting is done very easily uh, the same way then there is a line write of course there is a line read that will automatically for you extract this information from the whole memo field so it's extremely easy to use then we prepare for the transport uh, of course here the result is display but it could be automatically sent by email or FTP or HTTP request it's up to you and to do that we just again have one call doing prepare for transport of the string of information that was prepared before let's have a look at that method the prepare for transport class again uh, is in the sorry is in the CL protect class and here is what we are doing first we are adding random padding allowing for a different result every try which means that even if we don't change any information in the string each time we are calling the uh, random inform the prepare for transport information we will get a different string you want a demonstration of that very easy Let's do this we are going here typing just fh in Guadeloupe there's no need to spend too much time on that prepare for transport and record do it a second time the string is entirely different 
because each time we are calling for it we are adding any number of random information to it which means that the uh, encoding will be different for the whole string so it's another way to say well you can try to crack this thing but each time you're going to have to crack something different now that we here again we have a get random string of 27 bytes we're putting our normal string in it then a random string of 31 bytes you can do of course whatever you want uh, the hacker will have to find where the significant information is inside the transport string which will increase the complexity of the whole thing of course the get random string is a very simple thing it's a loop on the number of character with the random done between readable character only then we are encrypting and encoding the uh, resulting string this is done using WinDev native crypt uh, method and uh, we are saying that we don't want to compress it use the secure encryption and encode in uh, PCS which is a readable string using only ASCII characters so we are putting the result in the, the S result string and then we are going to add the markers begin and end and cut the string in 20 character long substrings so they're just a loop uh, doing this and cutting the thing in part very simple coding again once the string has been prepared for transport and in that particular case displayed in the field uh, that you also in the example then we record the formatted information in a parameter record and to do that we just do a param write as you can see it's not a line write anymore we're not talking about a sub information inside a memo we are writing the whole thing inside a parameter group general and name of the parameter is protection it could be whatever you want and we are sending the whole string all the uh, uh, if um, HF uh, syntax is done automatically in the class uh, creating automatically the record if it doesn't exist modifying the record uh, if it already exists and so on so all that, all that is done here and that's the end of the prepare for transport as you can see it's extremely simple The second step is when the, this information has been received on your server. So uh, the first thing to do is to get the information. In this example, we're just pasting it from the uh, first tab. But again, it could be email, HTTP, uh, FTP, whatever you want to use as a system. Entering the license information is all, again up to you. It can be a manual process or it can be your server automatically uh, creating the license information based on what has been uh, bought online which is a very simple way to implement your uh, protection schema you have a web dev program where the user checks I want that option, this option, that option, this option automatically calculate the amount to pay do a PayPal link to uh, uh, get the corresponding uh, money and as soon as PayPal say okay it's been paid generate the corresponding license take the received information and just call the uh, get key method which is in fact called in the class calculate key so what are we doing here in this button that is again an example on how to implement that first we extract meaningful information from the transport string it probably would be done already uh, if it was uh, an online process and for that we're using extract from transport in the protection class extract from transport basically is removing first finding and removing the markers and, and begin and once this is done uh, we have the meaningful thing in the middle we are removing all the carriage returns that were introduced for transport then encrypting the string uh, the same method of course this is using a password that is hard coded in the uh, the class and we can have a look at what's in it 
password is here, it's always necessary to use a long password to enhance the security of the encryption. That is, I think, uh, self-explanatory. Of course, if you are using my class to implement your protection schema, it would be a good idea to change that password to something that is uh, only known by you. Uh, that would increase your level of protection quite a lot. And remember that you can always put in here something that is looks like a command, a string uh, saying a command about your code, which means that the, again it will look like something totally innocent and not like uh, my beautiful password that I have uh, that I'm using to protect my uh, uh, application. So if we are going back to uh, our code, so we are encrypting the string and then removing the beginning and the end which are the random string that we put as padding in the first place and returning this information. Again, the code in itself is extremely simple. There's nothing uh, to be afraid of in implementing a protection schema. Uh, here we are displaying it for verification, but it would be stored, in fact, on your server in the license file. We are displaying it in a trace just for you to see exactly what's going on. And then, uh, if the license information is available, that's just a test in my program, but of course you wouldn't do that if the uh, license information uh, is not there in the first place. We are calculating the key by passing to that calculate key of my protection class the string with all the user information and the license information. In the calculate key, what we're going to do is use these two information to generate a key that will be different each time. So, what are we doing? First, of course, using local variable and not the parameter. Again, a good uh, development strategy. And basically, the key is a hash of a combination of the user information and license information. For those of you who don't know what a hash is, uh, well, basically, it's calculating a key that will change each time, but does not contain the uh, original information. When you encode information, you are in fact storing the same information uh, in a different uh, way. And from that encoded string, if you know the key or if you're able to crack the key, you're able to extract the whole information that was originally entered. When you do a hash, it's kind of like of a CRC to verify that the file was not modified. Uh, you are in fact creating uh, a key that is dependent exactly of the content of the original script but does not contain any information from the original string. A CRC is a very basic uh, kind of hash and a CRC basically is saying okay I'm going to take all the bytes that are in this file adding their values and the number that I get at the end is um, a verification key that the file was not modified. That's a very basic example. I think that CRC stands for Cyclic Redundant Check uh, and this is basically a hash is a more complex, more uh, strict way of doing a CRC. So for that we're going to use a function built in WinDev called hash string using the tiger mode of calculating a CRC on 192 bytes which is, if I'm not mistaken, the stronger hash uh, that is available in WinDev and we're just going to uh, get the result. Uh, here we are doing something uh, that is not mandatory. Uh, if you could basically take the user information and the license information, concatenate that and do a hash. You can increase the complexity by saying okay I'm going to take one byte of each and uh, create a string that uh, contains bit of each information, then do the hash if you want. Uh, that's not really useful because the hash is a very uh, strong encoding uh, system and that is a very weak one. But if you uh, have uh, want to have fun, this is just an example of something else that you can do. Once that is done, we just do a hash on it and because the result of a hash is a binary string, we put that in a buffer and then we are transforming that in 
hexadecimal uh, using that function that is already provided and also creating a group of uh, bytes separated by these dashes in order to give you something that is readable and even uh, that is possible to enter by hand if you don't have an automatic mechanism to do so. If you have a string of uh, 60 bytes with absolutely no separation in it, you know, like I do, how difficult it is to enter the information in any type of uh, uh, way that is going to work the first time. So once this is done, we have our formatted key, uh, this, which is in fact a hash of the original information, which means that any change in the original uh, string will not match the hash string anymore. So all that is done in calculate key and in this particular case we are displaying it. You could have this key totally invisible to the user just sending the uh, transport string and have the transport string automatically in the, fa in the, in the project. So you could implement something that looks like the Microsoft schema where you have to enter the uh, key by hand or something that is fully transparent to the user, he buys online and automatically receives uh, the information in his software and his software magically is now registered. It's up to you how to implement that system. We looked at the get key uh, button where I have this particular code uh, done and then again we are preparing the answer using the exact same mechanism that was uh, done in the other direction. So again lots of command in order for you to be able to use that uh, project very easily. Um, as I told you the user already has all the user information so that you, we don't want to send them back uh, that in order to increase the uh, complexity level for anybody intercepting the answer. So we are just uh, creating a string uh, where we are uh, using the key and a license ID as uh, content. And again, this is just creating a, a nice email with that, that's all. Uh, here we are extracting the name of the user in order to prepare this email, but that's about all there is to it. Extract from transport, we already saw. So now we had the transport string and for that we are taking the license and the key and we are preparing, sorry, we are preparing all that for the transport using the same mechanism than before. I'm not going again in that method, we already saw that beforehand. At this point we have the answer ready for transport. It's up to you again how you're going to send that back to the user. Imagine that you have coded your transport mechanism in the way that you want. Here we are just copying the content of that field and pasting it here. Basically, of course, you can implement something as simple as the user receiving an email on his regular email and saying, OK, just copy that and paste it in your registration form in the field directly and click on the button. And that's all there is to it. So let's look what we have in the registration button. Again, extremely complex code, as you can see. Uh, first, we extract the information from the transport uh, screen using the same extract from transport. Uh, we know that uh, we should have the license and key as parameter, so we're extracting the license, extracting the key using the parameter method again, line read. And uh, we store this information in the general protection record that we, in which we already store the user information in the first place. So that's the license, that's the key. And there's one added information, the date of the computer at the time of the registration. This will allow me later to test if that uh, computer was ever registered or not. And that's it. We are not doing anything here, calling the protection schema or anything like that. We are just storing information in the file and we let the normal protection schema do its things when it's time to do it. Uh, as I told you, I'm doing that on a timer, which means that it can be any time in the next few seconds or few minutes. 
We're just displaying a message saying a thank you as a user you're entitled to and at that point you can uh, display a string as long as you want letting the user read what he can do what he cannot do uh, open the help do whatever you have to do at that uh, point in your uh, software so at that point we saw everything that is in the protection schema except the protection schema itself it's time now to have a look at it so um, what can we do? Well, in this window I told you that we are using um, a timer to display the time and in it we are calling the uh, corresponding protection methods. Let's have a look. There is something strange here. We have already an event and then we have this time. Well, we are going coming back to the event later. First, let's have a look at what's in the timer. Um, the timer is called every second in order to display the time every minute. This is just done in order to do, have the time, the minute time change when the minute change in the system. There's nothing I hate more than to have my uh, time displayed uh, 25 seconds after the time has changed in the system. So by just doing it every second, well, it's done this way. At the same time, it allows other things to be done every second, by example, protection schema. So, what are we doing in here? Clearly, we are displaying the time, and just in order not to display the time every second when it's used necessary only when it changes, we are storing the last time it was displayed and changing it and displaying it again only if it changed. That's just a little coding to avoid uh, displaying things on the screen all the time. Then we are managing the protection each seed times. You must remember that in the protection initialization uh, of the class, in the, sorry, in the initialization of the protection class, uh, we were randomly uh, setting a seed value. So we have a global to the window counter that is increased each time we are coming in that uh, timer, which currently means every second and when this counter reach the seed value we are sending a message to the window we are not calling the protection schema again why well because if the hacker was able to understand that the protection schema is done in this timer i don't want to help him find what protection method is called again so again he will have to jump through this to a message that is posed to the window this means that is this is a user message if you don't know what that means well either you do it exactly like me or you just look in the help file where it's uh, explained and we are in fact calling again this um, main method main uh, window uh, with a particular message saying that we want to do something which is calling obviously the protection schema so let's look again at the win main code and we have this event when it's receiving the message from the timer it's calling another method called check protection and in the check protection we are finally testing if this uh, program is registered or not so clearly the first thing we need to do is to get the information from the program file about the protection which is done here using param read then we are extracting in local variable every information the name the address the license the key and so on using the line read method and then we check everything we can which is basically a uh, lot of thing we are getting again the computer information uh, from the projection class to see if everything matches um, the projection, the computer information that was stored at the registration time and if it's the same thing then it's the same machine, MAC address, uh, version of Windows, username and so on. So this is already a very good check. If it's correct we can continue. If it's not correct we have of course and else here saying that we have a problem so if the information itself is empty 
it means that, well, obviously it was never registered, which means that it's a trial version. And the protection display trial version invoices will tell. Now, if all the computer information is correct, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. So if the info is empty, it's a trial version. But if it's not, then it was registered at some point, or the registration was requested, and moved, or the PC on another machine, or the PC was modified, which means that it's in fact an expired license. If you modify your computer, please contact technical support. Yeah, we have a message for that specific case. Okay, the computer information is correct, but that's all. That's not all there is to it. Now we have to check if the uh, name, address, and so on match the key that was sent back from the uh, the registration process. So we are extracting the information that was sent through the transport mechanism in the first place, and we are again calculating the key based on the string with all the user and machine information and uh, the license information that is also stored in that record. If it's still correct, then the version is registered to and we have the name that in, in the information that is displayed. So you can have the information displayed on screen, on papers and all this kind of thing, uh, which means that you can have uh, basically somebody using the uh, the system that is registered to somebody else and have an always invoice saying that he's using a hacked version. So that's another way of uh, dealing with these things. If uh, it's not correct, at that point we have a name, we have an address, we have uh, computer information and all this information that does not match the key that was sent back from the registration process. So we obviously have a problem. That's where the date that was stored in this record at registration time is used. If the date is different than empty, it means that at some point it was registered. Correctly registered because it's the only time where we are putting the date in there. And then this means that the uh, it's an expired license. This software will a uh, good time to correct that will work in degraded mode only. That's better. So, uh, that's one case. Now, if the date is not here, it means that it was never registered. We are in the case where a user uh, requested the registration but did not receive the uh, key yet. So at that point, in this example, I'm saying trial version, invoices will tell, you will have a wonderful trial version on each invoice. It could be that I don't let the user uh, do anything in the, in the program again, it's really up to you. And that's all there is in this protection schema. As you can see, each step is extremely easy to deal with. Uh, there is nothing uh, complex in each step by step. What is perhaps complex is to conceive the whole schema, but here you have an example, a working example, on how you can that do that, which means that implementing that in your own software shouldn't be hard. And of course, if you need uh, more information on that, remember that I'm doing consulting work also. So I'll be happy to help. Uh, with my regular conditions, of course, applying. If you don't, well, it's up to you to uh, implement your own protection schema without asking anybody. You have now all the tools that you need for that. I hope you'll enjoy all that uh, for a long time.